Hello, all you kings, queens, and those in between, and welcome to episode 13 of the Busted Lines podcast. I'm your host, Paresh Maharaj, and for the first episode of the year, we are looking at the best and worst protagonist that anime has to offer. We are going with both definitions of good and bad protagonists, meaning good referring to well-written and likable protagonists, and bad meaning, well, the opposite. Um, This isn't a rank list or a countdown, it's just me and Black Belt going down a list of protagonists that we felt like we had something to say about. So, sit back, relax, prep your hate mail for when we inevitably insult your fave, and enjoy the show. So, who's the worst and why is it Kirito? Cause fuck him, that's why. <laughs> but no, really. oh boy. In all seriousness, Kirito is basically a masterclass in how not to write an anime protagonist. Um, like just to put it briefly, he is never seriously challenged by anything that he faces. Pretty much all of his problems he solved, like. He, I don't think he has any problems that actually last multiple episodes that I can think of. Yeah, nothing outside of the main arc of the story, which is if you die in the game, you die in real life. Which then again, that's not. But then again, that's not unique to him. Yeah, like when you go ahead and yeah. establish in the first episode that Kirito, because he's a beta tester, is just naturally better than pretty much everybody else in the game at that point, loses a lot of tension. Like I think it says a lot that the biggest moral quandary he ever has to deal with in the entire series is the fact that his cousin has a crush on him oh, which i boy. mean we're not even going to go into that today we're only talking about protagonists if you want us to rant about the whole of sword art online uh fuck we don't have anything for you to donate to just like spam us on twitter until we do it or something he's jesus could at this point that's what me and my little circle of twitter call him i mean to give you an idea for people who haven't watched um like later sword arcs i know a lot of people just stopped after the first season to give you an idea of like in the fucking sword art online 2 gun gale whatever it's called game to give you an idea of how much of a fucking overpowered son of a bitch he is a dude whose whole gimmick is being good at swords goes into a game that's like totally based around guns and you would think oh wow he has to like reinvent his fighting style or whatever or, like maybe an opportunity for character development but no he goes and find a laser sword which for the record is literally a joke weapon in the game and manages to in the course of a single fight figure out how to make using it in a fight legitimately reasonable like a legitimate like optimal fighting style and like literally him just completely saying fuck you and changing the entire meta of a game single-handedly is treated as a big character development moment which as we've established that it does it's not it's really it's, not it's hard <laughs> the biggest character development he even goes through is like learning to have friends which again like an issue with sword art overall is a lot of character traits are informed rather than shown like Basically, his whole not liking people thing is only ever shown through the lens of him reluctantly caring about people. It's kind of that thing like, I love the Mandalorian, but it's like the thing with Mandalorian where everybody is constantly telling you how much of like a shady, like badass motherfucker the Mandalorian is. And outside the first episode, Mm -hmm. literally everything he does revolves around Baby Yoda. Yeah. Like at a certain point, somebody is wrong about this guy. (laughs) That's true, but not the case. And, uh, it gets even worse in later seasons, like the season that we're on, Toonami, right now. Um, he's basically the he is now the protagonist that everyone just stalls until he gets better so that he can join the fight, which oh, is well, a good segue to our next, uh, yeah, to our next protagonist. Wait, well, but, but before we do that, what were you gonna say? Oh no, I was just gonna say, um, basically the biggest issue with Kirito is that he's a light novel protagonist not a manga protagonist so because he's from a series that is literally written from his point of view instead of about an ensemble the plot has no way to operate without him being at its center which like i think as we're going to see as we go through this list the best protagonists are going to be ones who really can elevate the rest of the cast to some extent so speaking of characters that don't do that let's move on to the next (laughs) one Oh boy, uh, this one is gonna, I think is gonna catch us some flack, but you know what, I, I really don't care at this point, because this franchise is just invincible, so, well, fuck it, let's just go on ahead. Super Ruined Goku. Yeah, I mean, if we're gonna talk about how Super Ruined Goku, I think we should first talk about what was there for them to ruin, and so I'm basically gonna play the Goku apologist for this part, because I am not actually up to date on Super, and then I'll let you absolutely trash this motherfucker. 
Oh, and by the way, if you actually like Super, I'm not going to hold that against you, but also Ho's mad. So le let's be mm -hmm. clear about yeah. one thing with Goku. If you grew up with like the 90 original 90s English dub, so probably Ocean or like the early Funimation dub, the, the version of Goku you remember from your childhood is not the version of Goku that anybody today has experienced. If you really... I don't mean to be like, oh, in the original Japanese, in the original manga. Well, you know, fuck you. This is a manga podcast episode. Um, in the original mm -hmm. Japanese, Akira Toriyama, the way he writes Goku, Goku is not a superhero. He honestly stretches the definition of hero. He's the protagonist. Pretty much all throughout Z, for Goku, saving the world or saving people's lives is basically just a happy side effect of the fact that Goku is a fighter. Goku loves to fight, and whether you want to argue it's because of just his natural personality or because he's a Saiyan or whatever, he he only really is able to derive joy from strong opponents and challenging himself to grow, grow strong enough to fight other opponents. If this sounds familiar to you, it's because literally any anime cliche you can think of was probably popularized by the original Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z run. But anyway... What happens is people have this idea of Goku as, like, this noble superhero who's the defender of Earth, who in recent stuff has only ever cared about fighting. But he's literally only ever been a character who only cares about fighting. That's, like, keep in mind, the point in the Cell Saga where he tosses the Senzu Bean to Cell, that's not an out-of-character moment for Goku, because that's totally in line with the Goku that tried multiple times to spare Raditz and Frieza's life. He's not too concerned with the negative side effects of letting these two people live. As far as he's concerned, they had a fair fight, he won, they should just move on with their lives. It's, it's that combination of naivety and selfishness that almost kind of cancels out and makes Goku into a hero because he can't accomplish any of his goals without... Con it's just, there are no good people who are strong enough for Goku to have a good rivalry with. He, can, he has to keep seeking out villains to fight, essentially. And it's not that Goku doesn't do anything good, like... People like to talk shit about Goku for being a bad dad, but most of the time he's absent because he's literally dead. By choice. Because Goku realizes at the end of the Cell Saga, him being dead does more good for the world than being alive. He literally is self-aware enough to think, okay, between the Saiyans, Frieza, and Cell, literally every major conflict we've had has been people trying to get at me. So me being dead, probably for the best. I don't think you can fault him for that. No. Yeah, the, the issues with Goku came with when Toriyama, either him, his editors, the audience, whoever you want to blame, realized that, like, he was too popular for him to fully go through with passing the torch off to Gohan, which, regardless of what your thoughts on that are, there are multiple points later in the series where it feels like Goku tries to pass the torch, but then Toriyama got cold feet and Goku has to come back in and save all the side characters that suddenly became incompetent. Like in the Buu saga, he could have just killed Majin Buu as Super Saiyan 3, but he chose not to because he wanted to believe that this was the next generation's chance to pick up the slack and save the world instead of him solving all the problems for him. And we all saw how that went. Uh, <laughs> lend me your energy. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, yes. Even from the sa beginning of the Saiyan saga, Goku just naturally outclasses everybody to the point that every fight is just stalling for him to show up with his newest power-up of the arc and win. But at the end of the day, when you talk about ruining Goku's character, it's important to understand what his character was from the beginning, which was uh, basically Hillbilly who loves to fight, and his love to fight often ends with him being in the crossover crossfire of the world's most dangerous villains and having to save the world. That being said, Paresh, tear this motherfucker apart. Okay, so in fiction, there's this trope called flanderization, where... Long story short, it's basically when one aspect of a character's, well, character starts to overtake their entire personality. This happened with Goku, especially with his love of fighting, and it came to a head in Super. In Super, Goku voluntarily and actively chooses, well, chooses to start a tournament wherein if every member of the losing team gets defeated... Their universe gets wiped from existence. Goku knew that stipulation going into the tournament, and he still chose to go forward with it. That... He stopped being a hero at that point. That's just... deranged. Yeah, I mean, th that's a pretty far cry from... 
DBZ Goku who like to say he literally went out of his way multiple times to lead antagonists away from populated areas to fight them in the desert or the arctic or whatever because he didn't want innocent people getting caught in the crossfire that's yeah. pretty much the polar opposite of that and just to just to put another nail in the coffin well yeah goku the, goku has had a history of teaming up with his former enemies it started with piccolo and even hell even now uh, there's a redeemed android 17 and 18 in this one but there's a limit to forgiveness uh, and all this to say is like you don't put Frieza on your team, okay? Just like that was just the dumbest, uh, yeah. dumbest attempt at a character redemption or whatever he, whatever Toriyama was going for that I have ever seen. This, this is, pardon the overused metaphor, but this is basically recruiting Space Hitler into your team. No amount of Sakuga moments are going to make up for that. Yeah, and just to further you, this um thread, I don't know if you're up to date on the manga spoilers for um Super. No, I'm not. Just go, yeah, but go no, ahead. Just, yeah, so for those out of the loop, um, the Dragon Ball Super manga has continued past the anime, so if the Super anime continues or picks up again in the future, it will be adapting this current manga arc. They redid the plot to thread of Goku giving the main villain a senzu bean halfway through a fight. Ugh. And then after Goku beat him, instead of finishing him off, he just sat down in front of him and said, You know, you could be a lot stronger. Have you ever considered training... And basically, they did the whole, well, I guess we beat the shit out of this guy, we're gonna try and befriend him now thing. Mm, mm -mm. Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. There is no. running out of ideas, no. and then there's whatever the hell is going on with whoever is in charge of the um, D Super manga, because it's not just Toriyama at this point. Like, it, at this point, Super is, like, based off of a bunch of people's ideas, including Toriyama, from what I can tell. Yeah. 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 Oh, boy. Okay, well, that's, yeah. uh... Two of them. Let's say, well, how about we switch over to something positive? So, a protagonist we actually like. Oh, cool. I had totally and forgotten we had those with this thread. <laughs> okay, and uh, so going from some to an opinion that'll probably ruffle a little Jimmy's to one that will not ruffle any Jimmy's at all, we here at Busted Limes, we like Kamina. Hey! From Gurren Logan. I'm sure nobody on anime <laughs> Twitter has strong opinions about this character. Oh, not at all. <laughs> yeah, no. So, yeah, I'm the, well, Parage 2, but mostly me, I'm the resident Kamina apologist. So, um, if you have any problems or disagreements <laughs> with anything I say, feel free to message me on Instagram, and I'll be happy to have a very polite discussion with you about this. The joke is that I don't have an Instagram. Go fuck yourself. So, first of all, like with Goku, let's be clear about what Kamina's character is, because I feel like... And I don't mean to be that asshole who's like, oh, you just don't really understand the anime guy. But, like, I do see a lot of conflicting interpretations of Kamina. So I want to just be clear about mine. Just so, to explain why I like mm -hmm. him. So who is Kamina at his core? At his core, Kamina is a coward. He is a scared, hurt individual. That is who Kamina is. Yeah. The air that Kamina yes. puts on for himself the stereotypical anime protagonist that he tries to be that's a facade that's an act that he puts on to inspire Simone and the other people around him because Kamina has a legitimate vision for the kind of world he wants people to live in but he knows that he himself is not the person who's going to bring about that future because as I said he is constantly living in insecurity and fear but he sees people like simone who he knows can overcome those things that he hasn't and so he tries to be this insanely motivational person and prop these people up so they can do what he can't and then he dies seven episodes in and he essentially becomes a martyr who is lifted up by all these people as a symbol for what they want to be and the rest of the series happens I will also clarify right. that Kamina dying is literally the best thing that could have happened to Gurren Lagann, because he's, like, let's be clear, he's the Uncle Ben of the whole series. His death is what gives everybody else new motivation and pushes them forward. Kamina's character wouldn't have worked if it had lasted longer than seven episodes, because, as you can see from how most people talk about him, he was getting rating as is. But I, I think it's important to note that what a lot of people's issues have with him where you know he's essentially becomes deified and a martyr by people post time skip that's not on Kamina that's on the people he left behind and frankly is not that unrealistic of a reaction to somebody dying I mean yeah. anytime a celebrity dies or like a popular figurehead for anything dies 
everybody immediately rushes to, you know, lift up that person's name and their legacy, no matter who they are. And I, I mean, and the series goes to pretty decent lengths to show why that's a terrible thing, because when, in the, um, in the fucking post-time skip arc, when everything starts going to shit, the common people fucking riot and tear down all the statues of Kamina because when you prop him up like that, he also becomes a scapegoat for everything that goes wrong. And Oh yeah, that's yeah. a good point. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to, if you're going to take Kamina for what he is, you have to take Gurren Lagann for what it is, which is essentially a pretty straightforward shonen anime where the power of friendship is a literal law of physics that can be applied to any situation. I mean, it, it, it ain't <laughs> that fucking deep, guys. Come on. Like, you, yeah, it's you, really not. It's you really do not, not need a drill to pierce the subtext of this anime. <laughs> yeah. Oh man! Yeah, but I, yeah. D- I mean, to... I love Gurren Lagann, but I mean, people who love Gurren Lagann and people who hate Gurren Lagann all need to just chill the fuck out. Honestly, it ain't that fucking deep. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. But yeah, everything. Yeah, everything you said is. I of course I agree with because we're basically a hive mind. But uh, yeah, his uh, his hide the fear and pain by being loud and encouraging to others. I think that's a shtick that's aged pretty fucking well, and especially I mean, nowadays. Yeah. And I mean, I will also fully acknowledge that I don't really mm-hmm. inter- interact with the Gurren Logan fandom at all. So if people dislike it because of them, sorry, but I. That's why I don't interact with fandoms. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah, nothing oh, will ruin uh, the thing you like faster than the other people who like that thing. Oh boy, too true, too true. Yeah. And hey, speaking of if it ain't that deep, you want to talk about some One Piece? Boy, do why I haven't seen it. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine because I want to talk about some One Piece, especially if appropriate since we had since we had Grant on here last week. It's only appropriate, right? Yeah. I mean, right. it was, oh. here's what I'm going to say as an outsider's perspective: you don't make it to chapter one thousand by having an unlikable protagonist. Oh boy, yeah, the, you you got that right. You got right, and yeah. so that likable protagonist is, of course, no other, none other than good old Monkey D. Luffy himself. Oh my god, this is, and like like we were saying with Kamina, it's like this guy, he's not the most complicated thing. Like, the most complicated thing I could say about him is that he eh, he has standards as to who he hangs out with. That's really the most complicated thing. Other than that, he's just like one of those go-getter protagonist who has a set goal he wants to be king of the pirates and he has a strong sense of justice too that's what i one of the biggest things that i think gives him most of his staying power like the moment that a lot of people say that they fell in love with one piece it comes along into the place called the arlong arc where it's the it's this is the arc where they recruit nami into their into their crew for those who don't know nami is the redhead so um at this point in the series Nami is at her lowest. Like she's tried anything and everything to try and get her free her town out from under the thumb of this tyrannical fishman to the point that she starts stabbing herself in the arm because she she got a tattoo of the of the the tyrant's name is Arlong. So she got an Arlong tattoo on her arm. So she starts stabbing herself in the tattoo. During all this, Luffy grabs her hand to keep her from stabbing her herself and uh, Nami of course is at first angry, she says, I thought I told you to leave. I thought I, I, you don't understand what's going on. And Luffy just responds, yeah, you're right. And that's literally all he says. And that little moment right there just tells you everything you need to know about the guy. Like, he won't, he doesn't understand the full context. He doesn't understand uh, everything that's going on. But God damn it, if people are being hurt, I can't just stand by and let it happen. That arc ends, by the way, with him literally dropping an entire building on the antagonist. As you do. Yes, exactly. And, um, just... I can just really just list moments of... But, uh... <laughs> list Luffy's greatest hits, which... Another one that, uh, kind of sums him up is... Speaking of hits, is, um... There's this one scene... God, I can't remember the name of the arc, but, um... He basically breaks up a... He walks into a slave auction that's run by... Basically, what they're called celestial dragons, but in the show, but the, they're called they're they're one percenters. That's exactly what they are. They uh, they even go so far as to wear like little oxygen tanks so that they don't breathe the same air as the commoners. I I'm not making that up. And um, there's this one scene where 
the spoiled little rich kid, he actually shoots one of a member of the crew. Luffy wordlessly walks up to the kid who shot him and just straight up fucking punches him in the face. Like, let me put it to you, the way it's depicted in the show is that, of course, the anime is entirely in color. The entire screen goes black and white as soon as the punch connects. So Luffy literally punched the color off of him. And it's like, if you can't get behind in a protagonist like that, like, I don't think we could be friends. I really don't. He smacked him all the way back into the manga. (laughs) Oh boy, that's an excellent way of putting it. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, basically his series is just full of moments like that. Like, there's this one scene where he brazenly tells one of his crew members to shoot down a flag of the tyrannical government. There's another one where he... Gets, he costs, That's another thing. He gets. When I say he has standards, what I mean is that no one is like immune to his standards. There, are, he gets into constantly gets into fights with his own crew because of their disagreements. Which the most memorable one being, of course, whether or not they need to move on from their old decrepit ship, the go, the Going Mary, because she's on her last legs. But um, of course, Usopp, the crew member that he gets into a fight with that was a parting gift from his hometown so he, of course he doesn't want to <laughs> doesn't want to part with the ship so this of course ends with them getting into a fist fight and Usopp does not rejoin the crew until the end of the arc and it's only until he gives an apology so yeah justice and standards those are the and meat those are the three things that make Luffy what he is yeah you can't really blame Usopp though we've all gotten overly defensive of ships before Hey! <laughs> like I said, send your complaints to my Instagram inbox. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. Uh, now on to someone who's a little bit more complicated, and he's the protagonist of my current favorite anime airing right now, the immortal Sugimoto from Golden Kamui. God, I love this guy. Because in Golden Kamui is that kind of anime where... Uh, you could count the non-problematic faves on one hand, and even then, there are, the qualifier there is that they're all either kids or very old. Because Sugimoto, the reason why he calls himself the immortal Sugimoto is because he has survived multiple situations where he should have died. And let me, let me put it to you this way. Right now in the series where, where the anime is, he literally has a hole in his head, and he's still walking around with it just fine. Well, just... I say just fine, but uh, earlier this late season, he exerted himself so much that brain fluid started leaking out of his head. But, but honestly, there's there is a lot a lot more to him, of course. That's then rah rah angry toxic masculinity military man who wants to who vents his frustrations through fighting. The whole crux of the sh- of the show and manga Golden Kabuki is his relationship with. A Sirpa, a little girl who's, uh, well, I say little girl, but she's, she's little to me. She's 13. That's little to me. Fuck you. Um, (laughs) but yeah, 13 year old Ainu girl who he has promised to accompany and to help her find, uh, Ainu gold. Ainu being a tribe of native people who live in Japan. And, um, but as their relationship deepens and as they open up, he learns to open up basically along his journey with a Sirpa, and honestly, I don't want to get too much of this because I, I kind of want people to just go out there and consume Golden Kamui on its own. But uh, yeah, he's um, he's the problematic fave. But damn it, you could do so much worse. Sounds good. Oh yeah, Hina yeah. Hina, Hina, motherfucker. Yeah. yeah, watch the show; you'll understand that. Well, yeah. Moving on from this, we probably get to one of two items on this list that will absolutely get my anime card revoked for not having seen it. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, I am, of course, talking about Ichigo from Bleach. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, you're... N- just all I've got to say about it is that you're not missing much. I, all I'll s- So when I say I've never seen Bleach, I saw, like, a few episodes. I never got through the arc where it was still just monster of the week type shit i didn't get to the soul society stuff but um yeah so i don't know that i've seen enough of the series to really have an opinion on ichigo anyway so i will again leave this one to you okay so yeah the thing about ichigo is that um he's one of those protagonists where 
he doesn't remember how I said that Sugiboto or not Sugiboto how uh, Luffy had a goal in mind like he wants to be king of the pirates I mean shit even well shit I could elaborate on Sugiboto too he just wants to find the gold with the Sirpa and maybe learn to grow a heart along the way Ichigo has none of that like he just yeah. reacts to whatever happens things happen to him he doesn't actively seek out anything and that leads to him just meandering around the show and it all just depends on the strength of the villains which eh. yeah he doesn't I'm sorry I really don't know what more to say about him he's really not that interesting because at a certain point you have to ask yourself why you're cheering for this guy and if the only answer is because the guy he's fighting is evil it's hard to get invested (laughs) right or because you just want to see his friends because seriously, I would much rather watch a series or a side series. That's one thing that I noticed about Bleach is that a lot of the times the things that I find entertaining are the filler episodes that focus on the other characters in the Soul Society rather than each the canon episodes that focus on Ichigo. And that, that ain't good. <laughs> Lord. Especially huh, Rangiku is best girl. Let's move on. <laughs> much. All right. Somebody I can actually talk about. Believe it. Why would anybody not believe that? I think it's pretty straightforward that I can talk about. The, uh, oh, the, the, wait, never mind. Come on. Uh, uh, yeah, I knew you would figure okay. it out yourself. So, yeah. N- Naruto Uzumaki. Yeah. He's going to be Hokage. Yeah. Basically, the gateway drug to anime if you were a child um, in the early 2000s. Either him or Bleach, I guess. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Pers- abs- absolutely. Like, I remember when I was. I used yeah. to watch those t- three parts. Watch with the episodes when they were split up into three parts on YouTube. That yeah, Naruto was the one I did that the most. Oh, yeah. with. like my god. Oh yeah, same, same. Especially with Shippuden when that started. Lord. Like, even though I fell off a little bit near the end, Shippuden, the Shippuden manga ending was one of the earliest times I can remember like legitimately feeling a void in my life when a series ended because like I had been watching the show for ten fucking years of my life at least. You yep. know. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Right, so, but as for Naruto himself as a protagonist, uh, you know, I kind of like, I, mean, I actually kind of like him. Because, like I said, he's got a goal, he's... The the worst thing about Naruto, though, is that he suffers from the writing of the series. Yes, yes. Like, at, like, and the way that his characterization responds to the various direction that the series goes in makes it hard to totally get behind him all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, to start with where he is in the um, beginning of the series, I'll admit, for a long time, I didn't like Naruto as much as I liked the other supporting characters. It took me up until a decent way into Shippuden to really start liking mm-hmm. him. But, like, the thing with Naruto is when he starts off, he, mostly he's pretty sympathetic. He's an orphan who, through no, you know, intention of his own, is reviled by pretty much everybody in the village because of the open secret that he has the demon nine-tailed fox sealed inside of him Mm -hmm. which you know is pretty fucked up right right but aside from that naruto as a person you know he's a rebellious rude obnoxious kid who is constantly lashing out at authority while constantly proclaiming that he is going to become the ninja president and earn everybody's respect (laughs) and I mean, of course, Naruto's only 13 years old, cut him a little bit of slack, but it's hard at first, for me at least, to feel sympathetic for the character who keeps failing at becoming a ninja, when literally every flashback to him being in ninja school is about him skipping class. (laughs) Because he, and like, basically all of his early character arcs revolve around him learning that just saying you want to do the thing doesn't mean shit if you don't put in the effort to actually learn how to do it. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Right. Like, I think the moment that encapsulates, Na- encapsulates Naruto's character perfectly is when he's been, like, slashed in the arm with a um, poisonous um, knife or blade or yes, something. Yes, right? I remember and, this. And, like, half of the team is making fun of him for letting his guard down, and uh, Kakashi is, like, just saying, okay, let me just, you know, carefully extract the poison. And Naruto's like, fuck that! And he s- dramatically stabs the back of his hand, and while he's letting the poison bleed out, he solemnly swears his ninja way. Which is a cool moment yes. that's immediately ruined by Kakashi pointing out, yeah, if you bleed any more, you're literally going to bleed to death. And Naruto starts screaming and crying because he did not think this through <laughs> at all. That's Naruto 280. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But ultimately, I think the draw of Naruto's character is that 
another thing that's revealed a little into the original series is that because of the fox being inside him and the seal that keeps him inside, he actually can't channel his chakra as well as other ninja. So he's working at a disadvantage from day one. And by the time it's established that he's an underdog, it's pretty easy to get behind him when he realizes how much of an asshole pretty much everybody else he's surrounded by is. Mm -hmm. Like... Most the big Naruto has the biggest number of asshole adult authority figures I can think of in most anime. Shit, you're like, right. Especially in Shippuden, when he realizes how fucked up the status quo of that world is, it's a fucking mess. God. But like, the the biggest issue I think with Naruto isn't even the character. It's just like I said, the way his character has to fit in with the series writing just makes him seem not that great. Mm -hmm. Like, his obsession with bringing Sasuke back to the village, even as he moves further and further and further away from what seems like, you know, the point of redemption. Mm -hmm. And, like, the characters call him out on this as well. It gets to a certain point where it's, like, him trying to get Sasuke back is really more about himself trying to satisfy a promise he made than it is about whether or not that's even what Sasuke wants or what aligns with Sasuke's goals. Mm -hmm. It's easily one of the most... Like, honestly, Naruto wanting to bring Sasuke back to the village is probably one of the most selfish motivations for an anime protagonist I can think of. Hmm. Like, not counting villain protagonists or anything like that. Because at the end of the day, there's a point where he's literally the only person who hasn't concluded that Sasuke needs to fucking die. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Like, it, it's... I, I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. Like... Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, though, the biggest thing about Naruto and his... Similar to Luffy, where it's, like, the biggest thing about his character is the way he influences the people around him. Like, with Sasuke and Gaara, like, Naruto's whole purpose in the story is essentially to get them to lighten the fuck up. <laughs> and accept that, hey, being a human being with morals is actually kind of fun. You should try it sometime. Punch you in the face. Yeah. Yeah. I will say the other thing that works really well in Naruto's favor is that he doesn't hog the spotlight much at all because he's an underdog. Like, he's constantly surrounded by other equally or more competent characters, and he actually has a really low body count. The majority of arc villains are not actually finished off by Naruto at all. Oh yeah, so that's true. Really, part of the reasons why I think Naruto stayed so popular for so long is because most of the supporting cast, with a few unfortunately notable exceptions, got their moments to shine by you know getting their own designated arc villain fights. Nice. I think my biggest issue with Naruto is the way the whole moral of the story kind of falls apart near the end because mm -hmm. like essentially during the final arc of shippuden it's revealed that naruto and sasuke are literally just the reincarnations of ninja jesus is the best way i can think of to put it and essentially the story turn it turns it retroactively changes the story from a story about an underdog wannabe village orphan growing into the hero that everybody loves and respects into yeah, no, he's literally born with, like, a spiritual silver spoon up his ass, and he, that's why he's naturally better than everybody else. That takes a lot away from what Naruto was able to accomplish when you point out that he's, like, literally genetically better than everybody else around him. <sighs> this The Chosen One narrative claims another victim. Yeah, like, the story was m much more interesting when Naruto was an underdog that nobody was cheering for rather than the literal fucking Chosen One. Yep. Yep. So, overall, just kind of mixed on Naruto, then? For the protagonist? Yeah, overall, I think a good protagonist who just suffers from the writing of the story. Ah, gotcha. Okay. So now, moving on to a series that I would be surprised if any one of our listeners have ever heard of. His and Her Circumstances. Or, as it's known in Japanese and, and abbreviated, Kare Kano. I've only met one other person in my Twitter circle who has heard of this series, but my god, I'm glad I um, t I got I got turned on to this series, because it is one of my favorites, and a big part of that is because the protagonist, Yukino Miyazawa, her, her character arc is just one of the most relatable in all of fiction, let alone anime. Um, So, Yukino Miyazawa, she's one of those people who's... Um, She's the she's the star student. Anyone <laughs> any longtime anime fan can knows exactly what the kind of character type I'm talking about, you know? She has the best grades, she's good in athletics, she's always there to lend help, and she's prim and proper and cleanly and always keeps her nose clean. Um turns out that's not how she actually is. In reality, she's a slob who 
swears and is foul mouthed and will <laughs> not afraid to cut someone if they deserve it. But of course, can't really show that face to the world because gotta be polite, you know? So she's basically the kid in the don't you just want to go ape shit memes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was, and all this to say that um, this is very much a thinly veiled metaphor for code switching, in my interpretation anyway, which, growing up as a brown dude in America, I know a little too much about. Yeah, it's al- almost like that's the main conceit of our podcast. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man. But yeah, um, of course... Th- Eventually, because the series has to go somewhere, she does eventually get tired of wearing the mask, and the rest of the series is ju- is really just her adjusting to the reaction to her newfound freedom. And of course, if I just if I go into too much detail with that, you might as well I might as well spoil the whole series. So yeah, the name of the series is His yeah, and Her right. Circumstances. Yukita Miyazawa is great as a protagonist, and maybe you'll find her struggle to be relatable as much as I did. Hey, let's keep let's keep this train of positivity rolling with another uh, favorite protagonist of mine. And honestly, this next one might be my favorite protagonist of all time, Toru Honda from Fruits Basket. God, I I know I just got uh, done saying that Yukino Miyazawa puts on the face of the nice girl who's always good and always pure and all that. Toru Honda does that, but she actually means it. She is. If uh, if Yukino Miyazawa is Don't You Want to Go Ape Shit, uh, Toru Honda is the cinnamon roll. Let's put it that way. Because um, she likes to... De- she's such an expert at de-escalation. Like, my god. It, there was, of course, um, there was this... Throughout the series, she non-violently like, plays mediator between all the different members of this family that's, that just infights to the death. Figuratively, not literally. But, uh, and, um... As I was watching that, I just kept saying to myself, okay, come on, this is just getting preachy. If you really want me to buy your buy your non-violence philosophy, do it do it by confronting the worst character in the series. God, I forgot their name. Um, But yeah, you know what? She actually faces down the big bad with using her philosophy and comes out on top in, in a convincing way. And I just thought to myself, holy shit. Well, okay. So she's just Naruto's talk no jutsu, but unironically. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, boy. I love Toru. I really do. But yeah, um, speaking of cinnamon rolls, uh, you want to take this next one? Yes. <clears throat> Young Midoriya did nothing wrong. Ever. Never. Ever. Ever. Like, seriously. what? Name one bad thing he did. Name one. Name one bad thing. He's literally such a he's such a pure cinnamon roll. He would literally be a supporting character in any other shonen. <laughs> yes. Oh boy. Like literally, none of the vices I could think of for any other shonen protagonist apply to him. He's not selfish. He's not a pervert. Mm-hmm. He's not overly aggressive. He honestly is so insecure. He probably doesn't even realize that he's the main character. I mean, mm-hmm. I think. The thing that makes Midoriya so relatable and so, you know, appealing to people is that he's legitimately just an unambiguously good person trying to be, like, the best hero that he can be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's refreshing in a lot of, you know, in anime when so many characters feel like they have to be, like, a total fucking edgelord or just (sighs) suffer a bunch. And it's like, Midoriya suffers a lot, but, like, I don't even think, like, his suffering up until recently, like, approached the same levels of other shounen either, which I think... Mm-hmm. is why people like my hero so much is that there are stakes but it never forgets its main characters are literal children which i feel like a lot of other shonen do right exactly yeah and um yeah yeah like it's a far cry from naruto's literal child soldier system that is like never really questioned up until the last arc and then even then they never do anything with it <laughs> right oh god yeah yeah like, easily, like, I didn't talk about it just because we're talking about main characters, and I feel like Naruto is no longer the main character now that Boruto is a thing. Mm-hmm. But literally every bad thing you can say about Naruto's character comes from Boruto, and I'll leave it at that. Ooh. <laughs> Kill yeah. shot. But yeah, um, yeah. one thing that's kind of got me thinking about Midoriya, though, is that um, 
there's that common criticism where it just he's just one of those people that just had his powers handed to him by uh, All Might, and uh, I just don't I just don't buy it because just because mainly because these are, that comes from the same people who like Steve Rogers. <laughs> Here's the thing. <clears throat> Him getting his superpowers, like, that's not a strike against him because what happens after he gets his powers? It takes him a season and a half to learn how to use them properly, and then another half of a season to learn that using them properly means not just copying All Might. Like, there's a reason the first, like, the first season and a half, literally, he spends most of the time not using his powers because he doesn't have enough self-control or discipline to use it without shattering every bone (laughs) in his body. Lord, that image of his arm just flopping uselessly at his side as he falls uh, during that uh, exam it was just ugh. God, right? <laughs> yeah, no. And then when he real yeah, when then realizes that his legs have been shattered too, it's a lot. <laughs> Protect that child. Yeah, no. So I take it back. His biggest flaws is that he's just way too self-sacrificing in that context. Oh, there you go. Yeah, and like he literally does it. He and All Might do- literally don't like start trying to figure out a way for him to fight without constantly shattering himself until the school nurse rescue gir- recovery girl just straight up tells him, yeah, I'm not going to fucking heal you anymore. You need to figure this shit out. <laughs> I'm not going to keep enabling your destructive behavior anymore. <laughs> That's like taking away the Senzu beads from Dragon Ball Z. Pretty much. <laughs> oh, boy. And- Either figure out how to win a fight without Goku or get Goku to show some fucking self-discipline when it comes to fighting enemies. God, everything comes back to Dragon Ball, doesn't it? Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> it's the nature of the beast. Oh boy, <laughs> this next one. <laughs> from a pure... Yeah, I'm gonna let you take this one. From a pure cinnamon roll to a... Hmm. To creamed spinach. Kind of kind of good for you, but kind of disgusting at first glance. Kintaro Oe from Golden Boy. Hear me out on this one. This guy, he's proof that even if a person is, or a character, uh, just just piggybacking off of Sugimoto at this point, he, a character could be problematic, but also still be endearing. But the thing, but the thing is, you have to have endearing qualities. Kitaro Oe, he is a law school dropout who uh, jumps from job to job and who finds some way to just oogle and perv on all the on most of the women that he meets so what makes it what makes him what makes him likable to me anyways he's curious like he has a drive he's willing to own up to his mistakes he's willing to learn things like even, like even though he dropped out of law school his drive to study i could tell i could totally buy that he was a law student you know because his literal catchphrase is him just saying the word study over and over and over again. And another thing, too, is that he's he's selfless. Like, he goes in, he, and well, in pure shonen fashion, he goes in, he fixes a problem, and then he just leaves. He doesn't even wait to collect his reward or anything. Hey, shit, this is, oh, everything you need to know about him is in the first episode. In the very first episode, he gets into a car accident at the lady just who hit him just pays him money to keep quiet about it his first instinct is to just chase her down and says hey hey i can't take this but of course she says she tells she convinces him to keep it and then in one of the best Chekhov's guns that in anime he uh he just gives that money to a bike repairman who so that he could pay off the yakuza and that's how the that's how the episode ends this is the same episode where he was he got caught uh, worshiping a the toilet seat that his female boss sat on. Dude contains multitudes is what I'm saying. Oh, anime. <laughs> <laughs> ah, boy. He's re- really easy cosplay too. Well, at the end of the day, that's what matters. Yes, absolutely. And uh remember what you said earlier about how the two things you haven't seen that'll get your anime card revoked? Yeah, we have time for the second one. Yep, time for the second one. Yeah. I still haven't seen either Full Metal Alchemist. Yeah, either one. <laughs> so, but but as we've mentioned before, uh, what you need to know about the two protagonists is they would literally give an arm and a leg to save their mother. Boo! <laughs> oh, come on! It's better, th- it's better than the million Nina Tucker jokes out there. 
Yeah, that's yeah. true. Which you don't even understand because you haven't even seen the series. <laughs> I've seen enough of them that I can probably get it, but the Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, we're here to talk about the protagonist here because uh, as we've mentioned before, me and Black Belt, we're both brown dudes and I know I myself, I'm a practicing Hindu. I don't know about you, Black Belt. You kind of switch back and forth between Catholic and something else. I mean, I'm practicing. I'm not good at it yet. Ah, uh, yeah. Welcome to my, welcome to my, pro- pro- welcome to the law profession. That's why we call it practicing as well. Yeah. But yeah, um, hey. <laughs> the way the way that I like to sell um, the dynamic between the two protagonists, uh, Edward and Alphonse Elric, who I will still get mixed up to this day, is that they're basically Ram and Lakshman from the Ramayan, but their personalities are flipped. So, in other words. The older one is the hothead, while the younger one is the calm and collected one. But for the hundreds of people listening to this who aren't Hindus, basically what makes them good... Well, chances are you've probably already seen the series, so you know what makes them good. And um, No, no, keep rubbing it in my face. So go on, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I would say that the Elric brothers, what makes them good is just how interesting they are to watch. And what makes them interesting is that... El- Edward Elric, he, speaking of child child soldiers, he is driven to bring his mother back to the point where he joins the military. And being a 15-year-old joining the military, it goes about as well as you would think that purpose would go. Because, oh boy, he literally goes from the farm to the battlefield and he just is put through the ringer. Even you even more so than his call to action where he literally loses his arm and legs. Hmm. Throughout the entire series he sees he loses friends, he suffers betrayals, and the little kid just keeps trucking. And he doesn't let it let any of that waver him or well no 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 I take that back. He does get wavered, but he's able to keep on trucking. And um Let's see, I'm trying to think of well, one aspect, one scene where that's really, that really sums him up. And I would think it would be the scene where, ooh, definitely the scene where he's, uh... so for those of you who don't know, um, remember how I said uh, Edward uh, loses his arm and his leg? Alphonse gets his soul uh, bound to a suit of armor. It makes sense in context. And um, basically the, something happens that starts Alpha, that where Alphonse starts questioning whether or not his his uh, memories are authentic and it's not Edward himself who um, who tells him this he has to Alphonse had to learn this through Winry their basically their sister figure and he, she tells him the story of what happened immediately after Edward lost his arm and his leg and Alphonse lost his body when um Edward was on the operating table and Winry was tried to cauterize the his bloody stumps all he could think about was was my is my brother okay and that's just the cherry on top is that at the end of the day he he doesn't get tunnel vision with his goals he's still cares about his brother and all the people around him he won't drink his milk though i don't know why he's also super self-conscious about his height yes so <laughs> Although with the state of the internet right now, I think Elric apparently being a short king works in his favor. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. Truly a man before his time. Truly, 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 truly. Well, now the positivity train has to come to an end, because now we got to talk about... <sighs> yeah, I literally added Meliodas from Seven Deadly Sins to this list, specifically just so I could say he literally grooms his love interest it is an actual canon plot point that elizabeth his love interest is the reincarnation of his previous love interest from his backstory also named elizabeth and he apparently was aware of this the whole time and literally just like washed over her as she grew up until she was old enough to be his love interest again what i I, i'm not gonna unpack that i'm not gonna dig deeper into that i'm just going to say that and you all can draw your own conclusions about that character Okay, this is a surprise to me because I stopped watching Seven Deadly Sins after the second season. Uh, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, hmm, hmm, hmm. See, I, but think, here's the thing, though. The one thing that I want to add to this is that I didn't need to know that to just to think Meliodas was disgusting because... Uh, he was already a horny piece of shit towards all the female characters. Exactly, anyway. yeah. For, for, first thing he does to Elizabeth... Let, that, that let's I, put it this way... Yeah. 
let's put it this way each of the main characters the members of the seven deadly sins like their personality is based off of a sin Meliodas, is, most people would assume his sin is a lust because he's a horny piece of shit. Mm-hmm. It's actually wrath, but that's not important. The point is, if you literally is that deceiving about his characters, that, I don't even have words. I just fucking hate him. Yeah, exactly. You, you don't grow up an unconscious lady and then expect me to like you, like, at all. Kentaro Oe would never do that. I think the moral of the story is that Bryce Pappenbrook needs to take better roles. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, now on to the second edition that you last minute edition that you made. Um, good old Satoshi. Ash, motherfucking Ketchum. Let's talk about him. Yeah, I, I'll start off by saying I don't like Ash, but I don't think it's his fault. Oh, the biggest issue with the Pokemon anime is that there's not a whole lot of growth between seasons because. The end of every single season basically has to restore, and the beginning of the next season has to restore the status quo, which is Ash starting from scratch with Pikachu trying to win all the badges and win the Pokemon League. And so what happens is, because of that, Ash's character development is either non-existent or inconsistent between seasons. The most consistent string of characterization Ash ever has is from the first episode up through the end of the Johto um, Gen 2 series. Because... What happens, but eventually it just, the series becomes a cycle of Ash arrives in a new region with only Pikachu. Um, usually personality-wise, he'll, like, be a little bit more mature because of the season he just went through. And, you know, he'll go through fighting, collecting all the badges, putting together a team that literally only works because he's the main character. Makes it to the um, Pokemon League and then loses at some point in either the semifinals or quarterfinals and then has to resolve himself to move on to the next region because we've got more video games to sell. Uh, So I'm going to talk specifically about the best and worst times this happened to Ash. In the Mm -hmm. um, Gen 4, in the Diamond and Pearl Sinnoh series, um, Ash actually is probably at his most mature because his characterization and character growth has been pretty consistent since the Sinnoh series and This is a series that introduces Dawn as the female main lead, and Ash is actually a mentor character to Dawn throughout most of this series. Oh, nice. And that's a pretty interesting newer um, character dynamic that they didn't really fully explore in the Gen 3 series, but it works out pretty well here. Um, The main problem, though, is that when Ash gets to the um, Pokemon League and he gets to the quarterfinals, um, there's... And I'll preface this by saying normally when Ash loses... Part of the reason why Ash losing in the Pokemon League is always so frustrating is he never loses to a pre-established rival. In b- both Kanto, Johto, and Hoenn, the character he lost to was almost always a character that was only introduced at the beginning of the tournament arc. Hmm. Um, and in specifically the case with um, the Johto was literally he lost to the guy because he had a Blaziken because he was from Hoenn. And he was like, oh, well, I lost all these Pokemon I've never seen before. Better go to Hoenn. Hmm. Yeah, but anyway, so they get to the Sinnoh League, and there's a new mysterious character named Tobias, who no one's heard of, and he's super mysterious and dangerous because he's sweeping all of his rounds and all the gyms with a single Pokemon. His Darkrai. Which, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Pokemon, Darkrai is a mythical Pokemon, which is the tier above Legendary. Oh. Yeah. So... To be clear, it is never... Like, Darkrai literally was a legendary Pokemon that even had his own movie at one point. But anyway, like, it's never explained how or why Tobias has a Darkrai. Tobias doesn't even get any dialogue before he fights Ash. (laughs) So, when Ash is fighting Tobias using a team comprised of Pokemon from all of his previous adventurers, he literally gets loses four of his Pokemon to Darkrai before finally beating him. So Ash has two Pokemon left, Tobias has five. How is Ash going to come back from these underdog odds that he almost always comes back from? Well, Tobias' second Pokemon is Latios. What? Yeah. Not explained either. Ugh. So yeah, then Pikachu and Sceptile, Ash's final two Pokemon, are taken down by Latios. Ash loses, and we move on to the Gen 5 black and white anime. Now, Black and White was pretty much a total reset of the status quo. Ash showed up only with Pikachu. Um, In the first episode, Pikachu is struck by a lightning bolt from Zekrom solely because 
for the duration of that episode, they needed Pikachu to not be able to use any electric type attacks so that Ash could lose to what is essentially the anime equivalent of a brand new trainer and his level 5 starter. And then, of course, this is one of the first seasons where Ash's character development was pretty much totally erased and he was basically, tactics-wise and personality-wise, was a total fucking noob again. <laughs> Damn. And, of course, again, in this season, Ash probably had his worst team ever. Most of his Pokemon did not even fully evolve by the time he got to the Pokemon League, and, of course, he lost. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have um, the Gen 6 X and Y series. This is a series where Ash probably had the most character development, etc., yada, yada, yada. The best, his, probably his best, most well-balanced developed team. This was a series people really thought he was finally going to win. Like, they even gave his Greninja his own unique, like, power-up form. Wow. And then Ash loses because Greninja gets defeated by a Mega Charizard. Ash's ultra-powered-up water starter, fully evolved, loses to a fire-type that spams Fire Blast. Oh my... At some point, you just gotta ask yourself, how much does a series hate its protagonist? Well, I'll answer that to you, because Ash finally canonically won a Pokemon League in the Sun and Moon Alola series. That's right, Ash won the Pokemon League in the series that decided to be a slice of life series instead of an actual Pokemon like series anime, which meant that he won with a team of mostly not even evolved Pokemon because he spent most of that series not actually Pokemon battling. Dang. Huh. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my problem with Ash, is that the series is so obsessed with maintaining the status quo because they can't think of any other way to sell video games that he is never given a chance to really be a character. And the money machine go brrr. Yep. <laughs> Pretty much. All right. All right. Well, next up, the last last-minute edition I made. Yes. Light Yagami from Death Note, a.k.a. Baby's first villain protagonist. Oh my gosh, no. Hell, Baby's first introduction to quote-unquote, black and gray morality. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I will say this about Light. As a character by himself, he's fascinating, but the series only works because of the rivalry between him and L. There's a reason why Absolutely. most people say just stop watching after, you know, the halfway point. But the thing with Light is that it's such a good character study. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the actual plot is so well-written and holds up to this day. And I mean, yeah. there's a reason why to this day Death Note is my go-to recommendation for people looking to get into anime. If you if you thought the discourse, for those of you who somehow still haven't seen Death Note, if you thought the discourse over Thanos after Infinity War came out, you were not there oh for the... Oh my god. You were not there for like, the slings and arrows of the Death Note Light Yagami discourse. Whew. I mean, keep in mind that basically imagine the discourse around Infinity War and Endgame if the hashtag Thanos did nothing wrong of fandom was actually a plot device in Endgame. <laughs> Shit, that's true. I forgot about that. He does like have his own little cult of supporters that... Wait, doesn't he end up killing them though? I mean, he ends up killing everybody. L let's put it this way. When a series manages to get away with naming a serial killer Kira... Mm -hmm. Literally just pronouncing the word killer with a Japanese accent. Mm -hmm. When the writing is good enough to make you ignore that, you know you're in for a ride. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I... Yeah. Yeah. I will say this about Death Note. It has the best tennis scene since Prince of Tennis. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So now, it has come to this. Our last item on the list. Where we must answer... The age-old question. Who is the best JoJo? For the sake of this episode, where I'm only going to look at the all the JoJo's that have been animated, because the manga is so old and it's still going, that, one, there's not going to be any filler for the anime for years to come, and two, it's so old that the 80s music references that were made that made the show famous, like, nowadays, they were timely when the manga were first published. Yeah, a lot of people forget that JoJo's was referencing contemporary music when it was written initially. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, limiting my... With, the, with those parameters in mind, let's go in order. Starting with part one, Jonathan Joestar. I don't think I'm going to ruffle any feathers by saying he is not the best JoJo, because... I mean... 
everybody who keeps nagging me to get into this tells me to skip his part of the story, so probably... Th those people are morons, and you should ignore them. Um, So, yeah, Jonathan, although he's one of those people where... For, for those of you who grew up in the South, uh, he just makes you say, bless your heart, every five minutes. Because... Although his heart's in the right place and he's got a good head on his shoulders, he is just so wimpy. You might as well call the entire first part of Jonah's Bizarre Adventure Dio bullies Jonathan and gets away with it until the final episode. Th that's really it. It's basically just like, what, 13 episodes of Lucy, Charlie Br Brown, and the football? Yes, basically. Except imagine if Lucy actively threw the ball at Charlie Brown's head. Gotcha. <laughs> All right, so how about part two, Battle Tendencies, Joseph Joestar? Yeah, he's pretty good. He's, uh, his introductory episode, he saves a, he actually saves a black kid from a racist cop, which kind of, is, which is kind of an, unfortunately a good segue as to why I don't think he's the best. It's what, it's how he grows up, it's who he grows up to be in part three. The funny old man who constantly curses loudly in English. That, and he also despises the Japanese. Ah. Yeah. He's, uh, he, he milkshake ducked hard. So, yeah, for, just for the, he came this close to being, to be, to taking the top spot, but nah. Growing up to be a racist is just, is just not something that I can really give the top spot to. So how about his grandson, Jotaro? He's voiced by Matt Mercer, so he wins. There you go. <laughs> I don't watch. I don't watch Critical Role, so I am not by. So I have a more, I have a clearer uh, frame of reference for this. Matt, Matt Mercer just has a good um track record with voicing characters I like. So. Oh, nice. So, yeah, yeah. Jo Jotaro is he's badass. But the thing is, that's kind of all he is. Like he doesn't he doesn't really say that he likes anything or that he wants anything or. Or really anything like he doesn't express like any type of motivation other than kicking <laughs> kicking Dio's ass, and that's another thing. It takes Dio's to it takes the fight with Dio for him to really do something that's impressive or that's really a character moment. Ultimately, he can't develop his character without getting any closer. Hey, that's that damn that's spot on. Why can't I think of shit like that to say? Jesus Christ! <laughs> but yeah, um, he does kind of become develop like a. T like a detective sort of persona later on down the in later parts but then that way he just loses everything that made him interesting the badassery which he's still capable of fighting don't get me wrong it's just that he's just put to the wayside a bit i mean is, i feel like it's worth pointing out that jotaro's series unless i'm mistaken is the arc that introduced stand users yes right? it is it is yeah so i mean i feel like it you know if you're the guy who introduced stands like you earn a few points for making that interesting right because if right. Stans had been introduced with a less likable protagonist, probably wouldn't have stuck around. Oh, definitely, definitely. And there's a and yeah, like I said, yeah. there's a, there is a reason that the his fight with Dio is still referenced to this day because it is yeah. a genuinely impressive fight. Like he has to th yeah. he has to think outside of the you t you want to talk about thinking outside of the box for that fight. He's forced to think outside of the freaking atmosphere in order to beat Dio that fight. But yeah, yep. it's a shame that it came at the end of the season, but that's why we have our two runners up who are running neck and neck. And honestly, it came down to literally just a mental coin flip with these two because part four, Josuke, or part five, Jorno. Josuke, well, Josuke is a good guy. I think you're, you're going to notice that the, a theme throughout this entire thing is that we like good guys. Like, where, whereas Jotaro's stand power was to punch the thing real good... So until it breaks, do you know what Josuke's stand power is? Something with diamonds. No, that's just a Pink Floyd reference. But his stand power is it punched the thing until it's fixed. So yes, he is a, a healer barbarian. He feels you by punching you. Some soul monk. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, actually, no, I guess they have the way of mercy monks works better for that now. Anyway. Yeah. But here's the thing, though, about Jorno. In part five, he's got a very interesting character arc, which basically he's because he's the son of Dio. So he's already. Right. Yeah. So he's exactly he doesn't really have lineage working in his favor. Like Jotaro is Jotaro keeps a close watch on him for that for that reason and that reason alone. And for good reason, because how would you feel if the if you knew that the son of an immortal vampire who killed so many people that you cared about 
was just walking around the streets of Italy. I feel like Giorno earns points for being one of the few characters on this list that isn't benefiting from some kind of Joe Star nepotism. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Also, his theme of becoming a viral meme earns points for that. That too, but even without all that, he still stands up as a great protagonist because he's able to show that even though he's, uh, in the show, he's introduced as like a common pickpocket and common thief. So, uh, but, um, he's able to prove that he's able to rise above his circumstances. He's ba- he's able to play well with the cards he's been dealt. And like I said, I can't, I can't really get into it without just without spoiling the series, but, um, just watch the series on its own. Cause he's, if I had to choose between who I would want in my corner in a fight between Josuke or Jorno, because, like, Jorno is, isn't afraid to get his hands dirty, basically. But, like I said, he's he's got standards. He's able to... I know that I can trust him despite his, um, his lineage. So... Because of that uh, ability, because of that whole arc where he, co- he where he rises above uh, the shitty hand he's been dealt, I kind of want to give the edge to Jorno. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I definitely understand the reasoning there. He's probably he seems like one of the few JoJo's on this list who actually has some kind of you know obstacle to overcome that makes him more interesting when he overcomes. Yes. It. Ab- yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, I think. Uh... Josuke is kind of, he kind of, but not really, suffers from the whole more reactive protagonist than proactive protagonist because he kind of reacts to people fucking with his friends rather than actively seeking out and, but which makes sense because he's a high schooler. He can't exactly do much, but still. But yeah, so yeah, I think at the end of the day, I think Jorno is best Jojo. Mura Mura. You heard it here, folks. I think we've pretty much exhausted our list out of people that, like, we can really thoroughly discuss. Right, yeah, I think so, too. So, um, yeah, this is a good place to wrap it up, because I think we've been going how long now? Oh, boy, yeah, a little over an hour, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I will say one notable right. exception on this list you may have noticed is Spike Spiegel from Cowboy Bebop. If you want to hear us talk yeah. about him, go to our very first episode, where we spent an entire hour gushing about Cowboy Bebop after I watched it for the first time. Hell yeah. All right. Well, until next time, this has been Parish Maharaj. And this has been Black Belt. And, well, let's start 2021 off on the good, on the good note, right? Sure. There's still time for that. Uh, yeah. Less than 18 days into January. Thank you.